Today's talk is about how SQL sucks and should die. I'm Monty Taylor. I'm a hacker that working on the Drizzle project for Sun Microsystems. Uh, that's a picture of me from Burning Man last year. Um, I'm a theater director, a lighting designer. Uh, I have no formal training in computer science, so um, everything that I say up here is, is just completely off the top of my head, and really there's no reason I should be here at all. So, uh, the thing is, is that uh, I think we're gonna, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we're gonna talk about a, a couple different things in a, in a sequence, and hopefully I'm gonna try and convince you by the end of this that, um, uh, except for some ad hoc query reporting purposes, uh, SQL is, um, yeah, it's a little old school, and it's really only being used anymore because we don't have any better alternatives. Um, and this isn't like the whole, uh, we should get rid of Unix because it sucks thing. It's, it's, I, I really mean it. I don't believe Unix sucks. I meant those people that say that. So anyway, so what is, what is SQL good for? Or we'll start with that. Um, it's a, it's a query, data, query and data manipulation language. Um, and it was written in the 70s. Um, what? Wikipedia says 70s. Wikipedia says IBM in the 70s um, for their system R system. Anyway, um, so it's, it's written for system R, which I'm sure as you can imagine from IBM and something called system R um, is probably something that we really don't want to think too much about the actual internals of at this point in time. Um, <laughs> it would scare all of us. Uh, it's designed for human use, right? This is, this is a thing to, to allow analysts to analyze data. It's, it's the specifically designed type it in, mm, select blah, blah, blah from whatever, and that's what you do. Um, it's pretty good for ad hoc analysis. I miss not having SQL on some data sets that are object oriented when I just need to like find one thing, like me, myself, sitting at the computer. It's fantastic at that. There's reasons that it's used for that. Uh, but in general, computers and their uses, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that they were a little bit different in the 70s uh, than what we're using them for now and, and how, we're, how we're doing that. Um, I could be wrong about that, you know. It seems that we are sort of going back to a centralized mainframe with dumb terminals set up if you sort of think about how a lot of web applications work, but let's not go there. Um, that's a whole other talk. So to start with, the problem that I've got for big, for big sort of web type stuff is that, is that SQL doesn't scale. It's a little bit too, uh, it, it's a little bit too server dependent and it's a little bit too uh, resource intensive um, for, uh, for the, a lot of things that we want to do with that. And to prove my point, um, because proving your point with pictures is the best way to do that, um, even though the pictures may not necessarily prove your point, but if you say that they do, that they do. Um, this, is a, this is a nice picture that somebody who isn't me drew of the uh, architecture of the MySQL server. Um, and you'll see what we've got in, in general here is a, a nice modularized server with uh, clients connecting to a connection thread pool. Um, we've, got a, we've got a query cache layer here that happens before the parser. The parser parses the query, turns it into a binary uh, execution plan. The optimizer then does that. And the really funny part about this is that they've got this parser and optimizer bit uh, split into two boxes, like they're two separate things. Um, <laughs> instead of being sort of massively interleaved as they actually are. But you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give it logically, this is theoretically what's happening. Um, and then the optimizer creates, creates query plans and these are executed by the storage engines. And it's all very magical and it's, and it's wonderful. Um, the problem is, is when you're scaling really big sites, um, this whole big gray box here is the hardest part of the site to scale. Um, because all of this is, all of this is inside one, one executable and, and, and to, to get this, this is, this is where you get the people doing all the crazy stuff. Um, so, so anything that's running in here, um, the more that's running in here makes, makes your site harder to scale. Um, this doesn't click. So, just to get us onto a color picture, because that was black and white indicating that it's in the past. Um, in, in Drizzle, um, the first thing we did uh, is, is, one of the first things we did was rip out the query cache, which has absolutely nothing to do with this talk. Um, but I just thought I'd rip it out because the subsequent slides will be based on this and I didn't want to have a whole bunch of Drizzle slides with a query cache in there, because um, it's not there. So, um, so we ripped that out. Uh, well, there's somebody working on a plug-in version of a replacement for it. Again, not relevant to this talk. Um, so uh, there's sort of a, a baseline for us. Um, so like I said, the, that big database server thing is, is a bottleneck. It's, it's always, you can always, you got, if you're running a PHP-based website, you can always just throw 100 more PHP servers at the problem. 
if those if, if you're not handling it, have enough load there, and it's just really not a not an issue. You can't just throw another database server at the problem. You you can add more database servers, but you're going to have a lot more work to to shard things and stuff like that. And you're eventually going to have to do that anyway. But you know, um, that's that's the big the big beast in the room. So the solution in general, the generalized concept for for solving that problem is is to is to keep pushing things out out to the edge. The more things you're running. So if you originally wrote it and you're like, hey, we're going to go with you know 1980s design and we're going to write everything as stored procedures. Um, and then the first thing, one of the first things you might want to do is start shipping some of those things out so that you're not doing loops inside of a stored procedure on the database server, because that's really slow. Um, uh, so, but, but, so you keep pushing things out to the edge of your cloud, right? Because the further out they are, the more you can just throw more machines at the problem and, and add, uh, well, more commodity machines. You really don't want to throw more $50,000 machines at the problem, which is why my employers at Sun don't like me. Um, so, the, so my first question is, what if we did this, right? So instead of instead of having that one really big gray box, we're starting to we're starting to pull things out of that gray box, right? So now, if we have this, if we have the parser side of this happening at the client level, then the time that's spent in the parser, which I believe for a lot of the smaller queries is about 30% of the execution time, um, well, we can push that out into the in, into the clients, which we have thousands of, right? So each of the clients themselves can take on that that computing responsibility, and then we can bundle that up into uh, into a nice uh, uh, into a nice parse tree object. Probably encode that using using the Google proto buffers that we're using for other things inside of the server, and ship that thing around. Right? So all of a sudden, you can do exciting things, like um, if you want to re-implement prepared statements, you've just got, a, 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 you know, you've got a, an object that you created on the client, you ship down on the server, the server can store it somewhere and somebody else can use it. You could take that very same thing, you could store it at the client side and just reuse it. You could stick that whole thing serialized, serialized up into a memcached server. And then so all your thousands of clients could all of a sudden use that very same prepared statement without incurring an extra overhead on the server as far as storing and maintaining that thing. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of exciting things you can do once you're starting to do that. Unfortunately, if you guys have been following along, you'll notice we're still using SQL at this point. So I, yeah, I, 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 you know, I know that I haven't really proved the SQL is dead point yet. Um, but we're not using SQL to talk from the to, to communicate and code the information from the actual client application into the into the database. We've we've abstracted that, and we're we're sort of going a lower level down. Um, so so we get start getting on the thing, um, and I just realized I'm talking really fast. Um, sorry about that. Um, if anybody wants me to, to go back and not talk as fast, that's fine. Um, so the, the thing is, is that at least in most of the clients that, that I go to see, I should, I should mention before I was an engineer on the, on the Drizzle project, I worked in MySQL professional services uh, for a good three years, uh, and before that did other consulting type stuff. So pretty much for all over the place looking at people's stuff. Um, and I can pretty much tell you that, that the large majority of them are not, not handwriting SQL. Um, because once you get a large enough site and you're handwriting all your SQL queries, you spend all your time writing the same query over and over again, and it's really, really annoying. Um, most of the people that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing are using the, using the ORM. Some people roll their own, but then what they're winding up doing is writing a specialized ORM. Um, something, something along this line is, is, is pretty much the norm these days. Um, the, those are just some random ones in case you guys have never, everybody here knows what an ORM is, yeah. All right, great. Um, just making sure. So, so if everybody's using these, right? You, you've got your object model. You've got your. You've, everybody's jumped straight on to the to the MVC bandwagon, and we've all got our model classes sitting there, um, and they're they're going to talk to the database. Um, we wind up with something like this, right? We've got a client app, uh, application. It's got the ORM. It takes the objects. It turns those objects into SQL queries. Um, it then takes those queries and. Um, we've already done the, the magic of moving the parsing into the client, um, so then we're going to take the query and we're going to turn it into uh, a nice binary parse tree and we're going to send, send that down to the server and everybody's going to be happy. Um, except, I don't know about you, but that step where we turn the objects into the query and then we turn the query into the binary part seems pretty l ludicrous. Um, it seems like a big waste of time. And not only that, SQL isn't really the best encoding mechanism. Like, it's, it's not really, like, if you wanted to have a machine talk to another machine and encode that data in, into some sort of sensible encoding, I wouldn't pick SQL. Like, I, I, not if I was writing it from scratch. So why don't we just take the ORM with um, the knowledge that it's got of the unit of work of what's going on and just have it create the protobuf directly, right? It creates the parse tree, and then we just get something like this. The ORM just takes the objects, straight creates the, the thing that it wants to do and ships that to the server, right? 
we've eliminated the middleman of, of that one step. We don't have to generate text and then reparse it in the same step and then ship that to the thing. We just do that. Less things to do. So I'd like to point out at this point, for those of you who are shaking your head and thinking that I'm stupid and crazy, um, that Google's already doing this in Google App Engine. Um, if, you, if you pull that down, it's the, the stuff that you get is based on the, on the Django uh, framework for, for Python and the ORM that you, that you get looks almost exactly like the standard Django ORM, except that on the back end, it's not generating SQL at all. It's talking in the development version to a uh, localized sort of form of, of their storage uh, thing, which is just flat files in a, in a directory in your tempter, actually, I believe. Or there, maybe there'd be a data derb. But then, then once you publish it up into the Google thing, it talks into the Google ethos, right? And it, I, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not using, uh, using SQL to do that, because why would you? Why would you bother? Um, and in their case, they're probably storing it in Bigtable, although I haven't seen the internals of that. Um, so the other thing that, that's interesting about doing this, if, you, if, you t if you're using something like the Google Proto Buffers or, or some other thing, I, we use that because that's what we're using right now, but it's by no means requirement that this has to all be built on top of the, of the Google Proto Buffers. I suppose we could use Corba. Okay, no, we're not use Corba. Um, <laughs> but uh, but there's, there's no reason why you have to go all the way to a, to a full-fledged ORM. If you're, if you're building sort of, a, of a, larger, a larger data framework like a lot of people do, um, you, you can just have whatever customized framework that you've got just generate these, these parse trees in, in the first place. Or you could interleave the, the same thing because once you've got these, then these are actually sort of machine readable and, 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 and manageable and you can stick them up and share them between different portions and, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, so but of course, that's, that's still just just generating a thing that's a, a parse tree from a SQL statement. So it may not look like SQL text, but it's still essentially the result of, it, it's designed like, a, like an SQL statement, right? Um, so what if, and, and here's where we get into some things that are a little bit more difficult to actually achieve technically, but they're not impossible. Um, why not just go ahead all the way to the, to the query plan um, uh, stage. If, if, you, if you're in an ORM and you know what your objects are doing and you know what you want to do with your objects and you've got a general, uh, a, a general unit of work in the, in the system that you're doing, um, then there's no reason why you can't, you can't generate the actual, uh, the actual execution plan of, of what's going on um, and, and send that around because you've, you've got that extra context. Um, so so what, if, what if you did that? Um, all of a sudden, now, now we're not even optimizing <laughs> inside of the database server. Um, and and we're, we're splitting that out. So if we had 100,000 of these clients, it, it's, it's less and less and less stuff that we've, that we've got in this, in this hard to scale gray box down here. Um, and, and we can, we can in, a, in a cloud environment, uh, continue to, to scale this in, in a sort of a much more efficient manner. Now, I will admit, moving the optimizer into, into this layer is much harder because some of the things that the optimizer needs to know are various statistics and meta information about the stuff that's going on down here. And so there is, there is, a, potential, there is a potential problem, there is a potential trade-off here. The thing is, is if, you're, if your optimizer is, is pluggable and, and you've got it modularized in such a way that it, it can exist here and it can z and exist here, then there's no reason that you can't ship a parse tree in some situations and in a fully executed uh, execution plan in, in other instances where you know the information or where you don't need to look at the meta information because you know from the way you've designed the application in the first place that you know how these things are going to go and there's no need to figure it out every single time you're going to do it, whether or not the table has 100 rows in it. You know it's got 100 rows in it. You know exactly what it's going to do. You know it's going to need, need to be this particular type of scan or whatever. Then go for it. You know, optimize it. That's, that's what optimization is all about. Um, and, and I'd like to apologize just real briefly for this little arrow. I could not figure out for the life of me how to delete that in open office. It wouldn't let me select it. I don't know what's up with that. So, so now we've got this, we've got this thing building a, a, a protobuf structure, because at this point, uh, what we obviously want to do to, to scale to be the next Facebook is, is make everything as, as, as absolutely bone optimized as we possibly can. Um, so we're building a, a, a protobuf structure, we're serializing, we're processing it, we're sending it down there. Um, and, that, and that's really great because it's, 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 a, it's a completely generalized solution. You can have, you can have any, you know, I can pull up a Python command line client, instantiate a, a protobuf parse tree and start adding objects into it right there and just ship it off over the wire and, and it'll work. I can, I can express any of the things that I want to do in that way. 
But once you get that, you've still got a thing that, that's, that's got to be, that's got to be deserialized once it gets to the other side. It's, it's a pretty easy, you know, it's a pretty easy operation to do that, but uh, it's certainly not going to take 30% of the, of the query processing time to do that. But, um, but it's still got to, it's still got to, to, to interpret that, that structure now that we've got. So the, the next question that I've got is, is why not, in some cases, uh, hyper-optimize? Um, so when we start having pl pluggable protocols, we've already got libevent handling uh, incoming network uh, connections and things like that. This means that one of the next things that we could think about doing is uh, having, a, having a direct uh, REST interface uh, to the, uh, straight, on the, straight on the database server, right? So instead of, you know, resting up to your, to your no, okay, there are times when I don't exactly want to directly connect the database to my end user, but um, <laughs> recognizing that. But, but if there's things that are, that are, that are simple, easy, uh, easy things, a, a Rust interface even inside of, a, inside of, a, of an architecture is, is a really nice way to talk between discrete units of, of things. It's a great way to, to expose an interface without having to, to do that. So anyway, so we do that. We've got a Rust interface there. Then we can define some of these, some of these RESTful locations um, at, at server startup time. So we've got a whole bunch of, of sort of statically defined versions of these things. We take the cost of, of building that uh, that execution plan or, or that whatever once when we start up the server and then it's just there so every time we're hitting it it's just it's doing the very bare minimum it's got to do to get to that to that little that little chunk of data. Um, I cribbed this from from ModNDB which isn't a uh, part of Drizzle it's actually a uh, an Apache Apache module that talks to the uh, uh, to the MySQL cluster NDB uh, data nodes using NDB API but it, just as an example because I didn't feel like coming up with my own possible example of how this might look. Um, but if you, if you look at, at one of the things that he's done here, this is being in his Apache config file, um, he, he's got a, oh, there it is. He's got a, uh, a location here where he's defined um, that we've got a, um, this is what the, the URL is gonna look like, obviously, because this is an Apache config. Um, this is gonna uh, map to the, um, to the car DB database, and we're gonna be dealing with the, the table car, so we don't have to define that for each of these sub-locations here. And then, so if you wanna pull a photo of, of this car down, we're gonna be doing a, uh, the primary key is going to be the ID. Uh, we're going to do an ordered index scan um, uh, on the uh, on the tags. Uh, in the path, we're going to pull a license tag uh, piece out of the out of the URL, um, and uh, and then we're going to return the photo column. And the format that this thing is going to spit it back in is going to be JSON, um, and uh, and the default type uh, for for that will be a will be a JPEG, right? So it's. It's, I mean, this is, this is lower level stuff that we're describing here than a, I mean, this is what a SQL thing is gonna get, is gonna get turned into anyway. But you don't have this huge chunk of, uh, you don't have this huge chunk of at runtime interpreted stuff that's got to happen to produce something which is, hey, I've got the number five, give me the photo that, that, that is related to that. You know, I mean, cause that's, you really, you really shouldn't have to build that, that same thing a hundred thousand times a second. There's no reason to. So. Anyway, so that's, a, that's sort of the short, uh, a short, a possibility. I don't know that ours would actually look like that because, well, our config files don't look like that for one thing. And I don't know that it has to be done in a config file, blah, 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 you know, but that's, that's for the future. It's a thing to, to look at moving forward. Um, so, so far, that's, that's pretty much all been about, um, about scaling, scaling websites. And, and when I say scaling websites, I don't mean scaling like the website that's on my server in, 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 in my little colo facility that gets all of like 100 hits a month. Um, for, for that, I, I think that, you know, actually probably writing it to send me an email message and having me manually type in the, the information for the web page and emailing it back to the server and having it displayed would probably, all, uh, probably be efficient enough for that to actually work. Um, I don't know why I pay for that server sometimes. Um, but uh, but the, other, the other side of this is the, is the data warehousing, large-scale data analysis things where you've got these, you know, these, these terabytes and petabytes of data and, and, and you're, you're analyzing them and you want to figure out, you know, hey, how much money did we make last month or, you know, whatever these things the, the accountants are always asking to pay our salaries um, or whatever it is that they do or maybe embezzle money from us. Um, but they've got to know how much money to embezzle if they're going to embezzle, right? I mean, that's, you know, um, no good accountant. So. So the thing is, is that, you know, those data mining people, none of them are using SQL directly anymore either. They're using ETL tools. They're using all sorts of, of, of crazy data warehousing tools. So all of, all of, these, all of these slides from, from back here, when we, when, we get to, when we get to this sort of thing right here, um, re replace that word ORM with, with the word ETL, 
right? Re re the, none of these tools need to generate a, a, a non-human, a human readable uh, string of, of hard to parse uh, words that, you know, that, that, are, that are very vague at times. We're, we're at parse time. You're not really sure if some of the words are functions or, or identifiers or, 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 or column names. Um, they could be any of the above, or they could be a subquery. Um, so it's, it's not really designed for that. Anyway, sorry, that's me going off on a ramble again. Um, so, so like I said, the data mining people, are, are, they're, they're not using direct SQL to do these things. And actually, one of these people, the thing that I find funny about this is that one of the things that SQL was originally good for is giving businessy types of people, the same thing, they wrote COBOL, right? You know, for, so the business people themselves could write the, you know, could write the programs and we don't need to get any of us, you know, programmer people who are dirty and smelly and we don't write, wear the right clothes. Get rid of us and just let the, the business people write their stuff directly. Well, I don't know if you've met many of the business people in, 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 your, in your businesses, but most of the ones that I've met couldn't write a SQL statement if you, if you beat them upside the head for 10 hours with a SQL book. Um, it's just not it's just not what they do but if you give them a nice graphical tool that, that has like some boxes and some lines and, and you have them drag a, a thing over here and then maybe they can punch some buttons and stuff like that then then they're pretty good at doing the analysis of the data but but going to actual SQL so so why those things would need to generate the SQL on the back end of the thing is, is completely beyond me um, and then you get to, to Google size data you get to the to the you know to the to the huge huge amounts of data well, they're certainly not using SQL. They're not even using relational databases. <laughs> they're using Bigtable. They're map reducing the stuff. Uh, they're they're pulling entire data chunks into memory and, and just writing writing straight programs on the on on the resulting stuff. Um, and in fact, in, in uh, the, the the Google folks keep trying to get rid of the the bits of of SQL they've got um, and say, oh, we should move all of that onto Bigtable. Of course, you know there are things where relational databases are better than doing things in Bigtable, which is the reason they haven't done that. Um, because it doesn't always make sense. Um, I think I might actually be, Stuart, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit freaked out. I think I'm actually running short rather than long. I'm, I'm not used to this. Normally, normally I'm like halfway through the slides by the end of the, by the end of the thing. What's that? Oh yeah, maybe we should, yeah, maybe we should. See, 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 now you're asking the hard questions. Um, so let's, let's actually, let's, 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 let's go back and talk about that. Indeed, so if we go back to, we'll go back to this. Let's, let's, let's skip the idea of execution plan, because execution plan at first, eventually we might be able to generalize that, right? But, but first, that's going to be not only highly database specific, that's going to be highly storage engine specific. For anybody that doesn't happen to be MySQL or, or, or Drizzle people, we have this pluggable storage engines idea. So you can, it's sort of like the VFS layer in, in Linux, where you can have multiple ways of storing the bits on disk. Same thing with, with, with MySQL and Drizzle. Um, uh, you, can, you can have, as, as we've got done here, multiple, multiple ways of storing that. So, so Mark is right. If we, if we start building, if we start building this version a little bit further down the thing, um, yeah, whichever one that was. Um, uh, oh yeah, it's way, way further. If we start building this version, um, th that optimizer piece is gonna have to know an awful lot about how stuff is, is structured and implemented down here. So this is, this is the, this is like the, you know, makes Bonte sort of giggle in the corner version of things. But this is, this is, the, this is the slide that's the least likely um, of all of the slides to get uh, actually implemented because of the technical in the next three years, right? Yeah, I mean somebody will do it eventually, but. Um, so it's like I think uh, machine training is available from the work on they did client side um, coding. Yes. Yes. You're not getting recorded. So what we could do in Drizzle right now is we could look really hard at the parse tree structure and after we get done getting sick, um, we um, work it over so that it actually can be serialized and do a proto buff. But the problem then is, is you, we have now married the guts of Drizzle to what that proto buff 
um, query structure thing looks like. And I would much rather have it be something where someone on the client side doesn't have to be a, a Drizzle internals expert to write the library that generates it. Yeah. So I think I think being being an internals well so actually I, I agree and I and I disagree it sort of depends on what the what the goal so so one of the things to to, to hit that because this this is actually m more related to the ORM uh, situation I think than than the other thing is is one of the one of the things one of the things about one of the things about SQL you know and and there's there's a there's a misconception that the S stands for for standard which it doesn't. Um, but, uh, but, but I think the, the, one of the reasons for that misconception is that, that, that well, people carp about the, the SQL standard a lot, but it, it, there's sort of this idea of this sort of database agnostic, it's this database agnostic tool, right? You can write SQL in one database and you can use it in another database, and which is probably one of the reasons, that, which of course <laughs> we, we all know is, is more in theory than practice. Um, it's, it's usually a bad idea to do that because you need to know about how the database is implemented um, a lot of times you need to understand how MySQL does indexes as opposed to how Oracle does indexes. So when you go into an Oracle shop that just migrated to MySQL and all their queries are running really slow and they're like, wow, this MySQL thing sucks. I'm like, well, yeah, because you've written your queries for Oracle um, and not for, for MySQL. What's that? Well, our optimizers aren't good enough for, for all of them. So the, the thing is, though, is that if you look at if you look at a lot of the things that, that people are using in the, in the inter intermediary layers of you know the, the ORMs and the things like that, um, a, a lot of them are having you know they've they've got per database drivers. The thing is is that most of them, with the exception of one that nobody uses anymore, um, make the assumption that you're using SQL on the back end of this. So they don't they don't have any any capability for somebody saying, oh you know in fact I'm not going to use that word SQL in a string. I'm going to I'm going to you need to execute this other method on my on my specific database driver. But we're already doing database specific drivers. And they're only those only have to be done once, right? So if you've got if you've got an ORM that's generating parse trees, um, there's no reason why you know the 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 Postgres guys can't write a, a good hibernate driver for Postgres that does the, the stuff because they do know the internals because the, the interface that people are interacting with is the thing that's important for it to be, uh, to be more agnostic, right? So if, if, you actually, if you actually work at the thing like hibernate or something like that these people are using, then, then, the, then the, the stuff that it's actually emitting can actually be really hyper-optimized for your database because right now it's really hard. If I wanted to go in and write a thing that like really knew a lot about MySQL or Drizzle, on the back end of hibernate, there's only so much I can do because there's only so much it lets me do. There's only so much information about how the database does things that can be encoded into that driver because SQL just isn't flexible enough for you to, to do that. Yeah, and the update statement. Better encoding for the then. Right. So how does how? Well, I yeah. That's 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 why that's why step step one is is the what you were saying at first. Take the take the current parse tree and and back engineer from from that because because we're not talking about reinventing relational algebra. That's yeah, that's that's a very bad idea. Relational algebra <laughs> is is fine, um, but the thing is, is that it's it's not a it's not a matter of of encoding, um, uh, it's not a matter of encoding that so that it can. I think the, the 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 part of keeping that human readable is is the is the part where it gets why why bother, you know? Right. Right, that is also true. <laughs> right. Well, so, so the thing that I find interesting about it is that is that we're we are caught up in the in in sort of being 
related to the, to the related to the relational algebra. That there's a set of words, um, but the, the the people that are that are writing applications a lot of times are are trying like this. All this work has to go into mapping what the what the application is doing onto the onto the relational model. Yeah. Okay, there's some hydrogen that expresses the relational algebra. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Get a, I mean, by looking at how, say, for instance, CouchDB uses JSON objects for this type of storage, and then you read a little bit more about, for instance, it, relational algebra isn't entirely dead. There's, for instance, like jQuery and so forth that have started coming out, uh, which I believe is my understanding is it has some bits of relational pieces to it. That's at least my understanding. So it does seem like there are definite viewpoints right now where people are trying to explore the idea of object storage with not an actual relational background. I mean, you know, it's kind of funny when we take apart what's inside of all of these databases, for instance, most of the databases really are dealing with objects that they store at a lower level. We don't think about them because you think of them as rows. But we really, what databases do are storing, for instance, objects with object timing. The difference is they just allow you, obviously, to relate those objects back and forth. Um, so, you know, sometimes I ask myself, would it just be simpler if we design the interfaces so that people just throw in objects directly um, and then just, you know, say, okay, you don't use the relational bits, we will hide that completely from you. But it really is just hiding it at that point. Yeah. Well, and, and as a... This is, this is the other part of the speaker role they didn't tell you about, is the running around with the microphone. Lots of exercise. Yeah, it goes with the hill walk, <laughs> where, where you get the, anyway. Yeah, yeah, like that's the emergence of CouchDB and uh, other similar things like, say, Amazon SimpleDB is what got me um, hopeful that things were going to improve. But then I just saw the other day that Amazon's put an SQL layer on top of their SimpleDB interface. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and the, the um, what was I going to say? Damn, I forgot. Well, can I one yeah, yeah, please. I was going to respond to that and then yeah. I was blank. That's right. Because, yeah, from my point of view, that's what I'd love to do. I want to have this magical data store where I throw my objects in and then can ask for them back. And I don't really mind if I need to use SQL kind of uh, s strings to get generate the queries that give me my objects back or something, but basically that's what I want to do. I want to be able to have objects, throw them in this store, like mark, update them, and get them back. That, that, that's my, what most people want in web apps anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, I worked for a period of time. Um, uh, the, the, the one, I, I, I've, I've had to, inter I've, I've interacted with one object database that actually sort of worked except for the whole scaling problem. It didn't scale at all, um, <laughs> which is really the problem with all of the object databases so far. <laughs> um, yeah, but the, uh, the, the back end of, um, uh, the back end of Zope uh, uses the, the, the ZODB, which actually does uh, a, a really fantastic job of that until you have to scale it to really, really large. And it does a better job of that than, um, than some of the other ones that I'd, I'd messed with. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, is, it is an object storage. Because once you get it, so the, the, the other thing is that people, what you're saying about, about people storing objects and uh, essentially storing objects, the, the rows are essentially just objects with, you know, with attributes and stuff like that, is that, is that a lot of times it, 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 it feels to the, to the end user like there might be extra magic the database is doing other than, you know, taking an index and looping over it and finding the, the objects that are, that are there in the row. So this is the kind of weird thing about databases. To me, databases are interesting when we're storing small little bits of attributes. When it's little attribute data that's fairly small that we just need to keep some kind of relationship model between. But when you get into actual objects, and this is where, where I think that the, the 
uh, POSIX file systems have really failed us is that we haven't really been able to find anything better in the last 20 some odd years around file systems. Because the truth is in a file system you're storing an object. And you know we see little people, like if you go back to as early as BIOS and even forward, we see people putting streams like HFS will put the little bits and pieces on those. But there's not a good way of querying that information and getting access or extracting that information out of file systems. Because you would think that file systems could actually index this stuff and work far better. And we could leave the small bits of, you know, 256 byte uh, attribute, you know, garbage up inside relational databases where it really belongs. Because databases have never handled blob data very well. We've always done it really, really poorly, and no one's ever been able to change that. So most modern file systems have arbitrary attribute data for files. They put it in because they want to implement um, POSIX ACL and that sort of thing, and so they just generalized it. And then POSIX has an API for querying all that, and I think some of the file systems, ZFS maybe, and a few others, index those for fast lookup, just that nobody knows about those POSIX calls to get to it. That's actually the real key, is just use ZFS and it'll fix all your problems. <laughs> So BIOS indexed any extended attributes you wanted to put there. The query language was simple, but it was also parsed entirely inside the kernel, which is possibly not a good idea. And they were like, eh. It also generates an absolute buttload worth of journal activity when you update anything that has lots of indexes. Like yeah, and the problem is, of course, the, the, the extended attribute API, uh, what's the technical term, blows chunks. Um, and uh, the majority of file systems like put this stuff in extra blocks. So you start just adding disk seats anywhere as soon as you start to have too many. I'll run up the stairs. <laughs> uh, don't go down the file system way. The file systems by definition is you have the user space, kernel space, security boundary which is going to be so expensive. You cannot do coherent caching with security without losing performance. We love, fi uh, file systems are really simple, but you cannot do fast lookups of attributes because you have to go bounce back and forth be between the, the user and kernel space all the time unless you just put the, all the data in user space and then map them and then you lose the security angle and at that point, you shouldn't be using a file system at all. You just should use a single file that you map, and then you're back to a database again. So there's no way you can do this at a file system layer because the performance impact is horrendous. So. Well, I, I, nobody wants a relational database. I mean, nobody has ever wanted a relational database. The reason we're using re relational database basis is just because of the strict and insane organization that everybody hates. I mean, you don't want a relation, you want blobs, right? You want objects, you've always wanted them. Wh what a, a relational database gives you is the strict organization allows you to do optimizations, right? This is why even when you do an object, object database, you then use a <laughs> relational database in the background just because now you can do optimizations that you cannot do with unstructured data. You can, you can generate all these optim, the, the whole optimizer thing that you have on the slide, it's all about taking advantage of the fact that it's not random blobs, right? That's what an optimizer does. And it needs the structure that everybody hates from a relational database in order to be able to do that optimization phase. So I actually think Yes, we all hate relational databases, and nobody, oh, I mean, apart from SQL, I mean, uh, uh, SQL in that sense is, is irrelevant, right? Uh, everybody hates them because they're very inflexible and they're not actually providing what people then want to do, but they do work really, really well, and the reason they work well is that you can do, you can generate this fairly efficient file format layout because of the, the strange restrictions it puts on them and you can then look stuff up and hash things and be very efficient at lookup time in a way that you can't with a generic model. I mean, I, I've, I'm sorry, my feeling is you're never going to solve this problem. But Yeah. 
is <laughs> blob store. There is 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 so not just a blob store. Um, is a scalable distributed way of keeping objects with attributes that we can search quickly. Whether the API end up being looking like CouchDB, looking like SimpleDB, end up looking like Hypertable or Bigtable or something, is I'm, I, I, I switch back and forth myself whether or not in 10 years one of those APIs or something like one of those APIs will be what settled out with multiple implementations behind it or is it just not a solvable problem? So this, is, this whole thing is, is one, of, one of the reasons um, and, and you know, obviously rather than, I, I, there's probably be a slide at the beginning of this, Ra rather than being a, a, a description of the, of the solution it's, it's more of a hey you know, what can we do? Um, so that all being said, it's one of the reasons that, that I wanted to focus on, 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 the, on the SQL layer rather than, I, I think one of the problems is that when people start to try and replace the infrastructure that's here, they, they go all the way and they get rid of SQL and relational, they try and get rid of relational databases and they try and get rid of, rid of everything all at one, one thing rather, rather than taking taking bits and pieces, seeing, seeing all of the stack of stuff that we've got and seeing where in the stack we can, we can compress out and optimize out like potentially redundant layers um, of, of stuff that isn't maybe adding value to the, to the stack as a whole. Um, one thing, by the way, is remember there's mobile FS and that's where we see a lot of this stuff. Where mobile FS is a, both gives you a POSIX interface through NFS and a non-POSIX interface through a REST interface. So there is definitely large amounts of usage of that on the planet nowadays, and that seems to be growing. So there, there is a need uh, for that, and that's obviously been. But the, the thing that I was going to comment upon about, like, so when database, uh, when, so when, like, the ones of us who, like, build databases sitting around in a room, we're going, hmm, what could we really want to do? Our usual goal is to throw out the operating system. That's what we sit around and think, going, you know what, we've already written everything, and we don't need to write sound drivers, so screw it. What if we just throw out the OS? Uh, because what, we can bypass everything, get access to everything we want to, we already schedule our own threads, we already schedule our own I.O., you know. But the thing we discovered a long time ago is even if we go down that path a little ways, like, for instance, databases, um, a lot of different databases can implement uh, their own file systems on top of raw disk. Because the whole idea is, well, screw the OS, we'll just go directly against the character device ourselves. But everyone's discovered long term, that is a disaster. It gains you about 3% at most generally performance most cases. And the bigger problem is, is that then the in sysadmin doesn't have the tools to actually manage that stuff at all. They have no ability to back it up unless they're using one of our backup tools, they don't know how to manage it, does it expand across disks, it just turns out it's a disaster. So we just drop ourselves on the file system and make you guys like hold your nose when we say we'd like to oh direct please. Um, because it's the only way we know how to get past the entire uh, problem of like most file system pieces. But when it gets down to it, though, you know, we're still actually storing stuff on disk. You know, we look at, like, the relational databases out there. Some good chunk of them, they're still just dropping blobs in a directory somewhere, calling them special names and moving on and not creating, like, a blob space, for instance, inside of it. So, you know, th there's some passage here where, yeah, we can handle structured data. But at the same time, at the file system layer, you know, I look at that and say, why aren't file systems a lot smarter? You know, why is it that, you know, uh, why is it that it doesn't know, understand a lot more than just little bits of information we've extended by putting a file extension on the end of the file? You know, why is it can't index things? Why is it can't, you know, drop filtered plugins in that suddenly understand 14 or 15 different file formats and give us back, you know, o more information on it? I mean, neither model here is really working. The relational model we're going to have around, SQL is going to be around for another 30 years probably, if not longer. That's how, you know. Yeah, so that SQL is going to, SQL is going to continue being around, but there is, seems to be a need to move away from the, the what we've considered Unix-based file systems and at the same time get away from where we've dealt with blobs for a long time. But with so, some kind of a standard f API to that stuff, none of us can ever write anything to it because, well, it just doesn't exist. I mean, I, it's interesting that REST, REST storage seems to be the thing that gets everybody hot and bothered. We look at like S3 and stuff. But REST storage is pretty kind of crappy if you think about it as far as the amount of overhead wasted and everything else. But on the other hand, eh, we got a lot of bandwidth nowadays. Maybe we just waste this stuff. So, um, any other thoughts or ideas? Yes, back there. Gosh, okay. Can all of you move? Like the people that are talking. Let's move to one little. Gosh, I got that walking up the hill last night. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, that'll never happen. <laughs>
this is just an idle thought, but like I, I've noticed that more and more the use of like at least say in the Java world things like Lucene, but I think Lucene has been ported across a whole variety of um, platforms or languages. Like that provides kind of like a middle ground where you're getting your kind of unstructured data that you're indexing in a reasonable way, and then you've got some kind of um, query mechanism. It's not the structured query right. mechanism, it's unstructured, but it seems to be the kind of thing that people actually, like people who aren't programmers want to use. It's the kind of queries they type into Google and get, expect an answer back. That's that's actually the thing is that now now we've got a, a we've got a whole a whole generation of people that are coming up that just want to they just want to Google the data in, the, in their program <laughs> you know they're like uh, I I want I want that data that I stored on my cat uh, somebody know where that is anybody Google help my cat the pictures the orange one. <laughs> yeah, and you're like oh hey that's a picture of a cat sort of looks like my cat. Maybe it's my cat. That's eh, good enough. Um, so. And everyone seems to just end up splatting the JPEGs on, JPEGs on disk, and then going, hey, these file systems you can't actually replicate anywhere. So then, like shoving it in the database-ish, or using something else to do it at some point, and have about mobile affairs, and then having four implementations of it, then indexing all the metadata and the and the EXIF data and the JPEGs like in a relational database, and then just hoping nothing ever crashes and get out gets out of sync. There's a lot. There's a very large Web 2.0 company that does. There's a very large Web 2.0 company that does nothing but that, and they make good money doing it because it's a hard problem. Flickr. Yeah. And really, I just want to index the ones I take, and <laughs> even that is it just doesn't work and seems overly complex. So there's part of the random structured data thing, and there's this like partial simple things that just no one's come up with something sensible yet, or sat down and solved it. I don't think you can call Web Flickr a Web 2.0 company anymore. They were bought by a Web 1.0 company. <laughs> or a Web 0 0.5 since it was really one of the, the absolute first. Sorry, that really had nothing to do with anything other than trying to get a laugh out of somebody. Anybody else? Yes, in the middle of the room. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it probably it probably depends. I'm imagining for some of for really really I mean I you know I'd, I'd have to I'd have to go and, and look at it, you know like like actually once we but. So we send across the wire stuff that's yeah. that's fairly compact anyway. And the big thing that always kills you is latency. No matter what network link you have, the amount of data you're sending is pretty much irrelevant. It's always the actual latency across the wires. It's all batch everything together and doesn't really matter on the encoding. The big important thing is is actually being able to easily distribute this across many machines. Yeah. Um, because doing like uh, yeah, remotely consistent uh, distributed databases turns out to be hard. Um, and sort of splatting everything else out to the edge is a lot easier, which yeah. is why web servers go up and database people cry in the corner. So, yeah. Monty, so tell us about what we've done in Drizzle to make the, le to deal with the latency trickles and round trip problems in the protocol. Do you know how that works? Oh, yeah. Well, so there's a fun thing. There's actually something I was going to say to, to that up there. Uh, remind me in three seconds, because there's the other thing that I was going to say to what Stuart just said, which is. Um, Oh yeah, which is which is there. So he said the words that how you encode it is is pretty irrelevant, and and I, I I'm, I'm that's pretty much what I'm that's sort of the main point I'm I'm trying to make up here is this encoding is fairly relevant. So if the encoding is relevant, then encoding it in such a way that is expensive to unencode on the server is 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 a waste of, of energy. Is is the is the main sort of sort of thing. Not necessarily that that. Yeah, so anyway, so that's the. That's sort of that, that bit there. Um, but uh, so in, in, in Drizzle, so what Stuart just said about the, the round trips being a problem, um, we got rid of the initial off packet for, for one thing. So there's, there's less packets you have, to, you have to send back and forth. Or is there a different thing you're thinking about? Oh, right, yeah. So also did the, the asynchronous uh, uh, asynchronous queries uh, in the in, in, and batching in the in the drizzle 
client, which you can actually also use with the MySQL server, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, so you can, you can start firing queries at it, and then when they're ready, then you, you get back, and you don't have to you don't have to wait on the on the uh, on the round trip latency there. Yeah, if the thing's too large, then you can just piece it and, and send it across. Yeah. <laughs> or you just deal with it. You chunk things big enough, and it just kind of works Stop eventually. Result sets. <laughs> Write different data. <laughs> what was I going to say? I don't know. I've blown your. Yeah, something. Said something about. Pretend I said something intelligent yeah. just now. Oh, so that was so something something um, that was set up there about the the that you lose the security. Um, I, I don't want to say that security is always um, unimportant. It's certainly important in many in many cases, but in in a lot of cases it seems like this is one of the things that. That, that we did do in Drizzle as well is that there are also times when if you've gotten that far into the into the infrastructure, um, an extra layer of security is probably because once you, once your once your sort of ring of data center has been breached, you're you're pretty frickin' hosed. Um, yeah. So not that we should totally toss it out, but sometimes I think that we might over that. It's um, from the um, sites I saw doing professional services for MySQL and talking to the other PS people. In the real world now, um, your security boundary is wrapped around a cluster of machines doing a related task, often just your entire site, or maybe separate your web server and your database server set. Except for legal reasons, nobody uses fine-grained security, either on the file system or um, to serve sites or in the database server itself. And by for legal reasons, um, in the United States, you, um, the PIC standard and um, Sarbanes-Oxley give you safe harbor to do all sorts of stupid shit that people do, but they don't use. Um, but practical security now is no longer fine grain. It's your, fl your fleet of database servers is one security boundary. Your, your application server fleet is another security boundary. Um, and the fine grain stuff is just not used. When you're doing a bazillion queries a second, checking checking that your that your that your your web application, which has been sitting there for a week, is still uh, uh, authorized to access the data that's been sitting there for a week, every single time, is well, um, expensive. Yeah. So this kind of gets in a little bit before. The cost of the, the security model inside the database is generally too expensive for most companies. Most companies just turn the database on with drop permissions and just sit there and run straight against it. But that's more in the Web 2.0 space. If you look at, for instance, the banking space, there's kind of like almost a confused view there. Because you'll see them put ACLs on, on pretty much row attribute pieces so that the row attribute pieces can't be you know, accessed or at least at the very least are logged by the fact that, look, such and such talk, talk to a credit card. But on the same time, you go into banks and you know, this is something I've been and I was surprised a few years ago when I started discovering this, but a lot of banks run their applications in kind of a willy-nilly fashion uh, in their own way. But instead of looking at permissions, for instance, they drop pennies all the time. You know, there was a bank I once asked, like, so what do you think you're losing per month by it? Because I was what, examining how they were using not actually MySQL but another database because it was kind of obvious looking at it that they were going to drop, drop pennies every so often in it. And they said, well, you know what, we lose about 40000 a month. Um, you know, on this, but we're, that's an acceptable cost compared to buying all the hardware to actually fix the damn problem. So if we lose forty thousand a month in just pennies that are are rounded to the wrong degree, eh, that's okay. We don't really care. It's too expensive. But the ACL stuff, they actually still check that. But that's a very different from a kind of an older brick and mortar view of the world where we have to know every single check compared to web centric companies that, frankly, just don't check anything at all. They don't really care. Anything else? All right. I think we might be around that lunchtime where they have the food and we eat it. No, we oh, we have a talk. We have another talk. <laughs> Gosh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs>